Um, so how do you mitigate these vulnerabilities? There's a few different ways. I'm sure that for some of the people in the audience, these aren't surprising, but go through them anyway. Um, the first one for design vulnerabilities, like a, a design vulnerability is where you're making a new DeFi protocol and your protocol is just designed poorly. So it has like some sort of runaway inflation scenario or it allows someone to claim funds that aren't theirs, something like that. Um, and so there's a couple different ways you can mitigate these types of design vulnerabilities where your economic system is just not designed properly from the start. The first one is just writing down a specification. Most people write down like a white paper, which is kind of an informal specification for the most part, but you can make this more rigorous. You can make it kind of mathematically rigorous and actually just describe the economics of your protocol directly. Um, the next one is you can get an audit, which is where a third party is basically gonna review your design specification and try to find holes in it, try to find exploits, and then also try in a bunch of specific ways that you convinced yourself that you've exercised all of the possibilities so you know that your design is safe. Um, code vulnerabilities, it's actually very similar, the, the different approaches, it's just that we kind of give them different names. So testing is kind of like the analogy of like, you know, that first white paper of specifications. You write down some unit tests, you're specifying the exact behavior that your code should have on those particular cases, right? Regression tests are where you are, you know, you, you observe an errant behavior in your system, right? You write down a specification as a unit test that catches that errant behavior so that it won't be reintroduced in your system on a V2 or a V2.1 or something like that. And then one that's kind of new to uh, the crypto scene but is not so new to other fields is property testing, which is, um, kind of a supercharged unit testing or it's parametric unit testing. And this is really cool because it gets developers to start thinking about writing specifications down directly as tests, right? So you write down a property test or a parametric test that describes a wide class of behaviors of your system instead of just one particular behavior like a unit test does. Um, so I wanna get into people's mind, like testing is kind of like specification, testing, specification, right? Um, and then of course you can get an audit, which a lot of people here in this room are probably familiar with. Uh, there's a bunch of analysis tools. There's like two broad categories of analysis tools, just kind of static and dynamic tools. A lot of people in this room are working on various analysis tools. I'm sure everyone here has run Slither at some point, which is a static analysis tool. Um, so these tools are, you know, looking at the code for you and trying to find like just common code smells or anti-patterns or things like that. Um, yeah, and then finally verification is where you write down a specification, which is the intended behavior of your code, and you go and ask the computer to check that, you know, your code actually meets that specification, right? So you have to somehow have a language that both the human can write and the computer can read for this to be a viable approach, right? That you write your specification down. Um, and then just a quick slide, what does an audit from runtime verification look like? We do this like verification oriented auditing. So usually that means it comes in two different phases, like a design modeling phase and a code review phase. The design modeling phase is that, you know, that formal specification of your design type of thing. And usually actually the most critical bugs we find come from this phase. Cause if your design is not sound, like you have no hope, right? There's no way you can implement code that suddenly makes it sound, right? So, and then code review, if, you, if you've already done design modeling, code review becomes a little easier, actually, because instead of looking through your code and thinking, is this correct, is this correct, you just have to look through your code and say, does it implement the design model that I already made, right? It's, more, it's a more mechanical check at that point. So if you go through the design modeling first, somehow the code review becomes a little easier. <clears throat> okay, so I wanna talk about property testing a little bit. Um, so property testing is not really a new technique. It's kind of new to blockchain. It is new in computer science in general, I guess, but it's, you know, it's really new to blockchain. But there's a bunch of examples, like the most famous one, the, mo the first one that got really popular was Haskell Quick Check. So this allowed you to write down um, you know, a, a test that was parametric in a few inputs, and then the testing harness would fill those inputs in with random values and then run the test a bunch of times with a bunch of different random values and you get kind of a, you know, from one test, you get maybe thousands of test runs, right? And so it's a little more powerful than just unit testing. Um, and then there's Python hypothesis. Another one that's interesting is this experiment here. This link is to a paper by Amazon where they had their, um, 
they had their engineers who were writing C code start writing down property tests themselves, and they hooked those property tests up to a tool called CVMC, which is like a symbolic model checker, to actually verify that those property tests are working. And that ended up being wildly successful within Amazon in terms of improving their code quality, finding lots of bugs, and also, you know, they were able to take developers who didn't have much verification experience prior and suddenly get them to start doing formal verification without even really realizing that that's what they were doing. So that's, that's why I think it's a cool approach. And then most recently we have this Foundry tool, uh, which is basically offering the same thing, right? This property testing or parametric testing, but for Solidity code and wrapped up in a really nice package that gives you fast execution and all sorts of nice things like that. Um, yeah, so the idea here is a parametric test and the idea is, you know, you, you get your developers to start thinking about their specifications and their properties themselves, and suddenly they come to us with much higher quality code from the start because they're already thinking about their specification and properties from the start as they're writing their code. Um, and I just want to emphasize that property testing is really a developer tool as opposed to later in the, the presentation I'm going to be talking about like an expert tool. Right? An expert tool is something that you have to like spend, some, you have to invest a lot of time to be able to use, but a developer tool is something that is just a step above what you would, you know, be able to do as a normal developer anyway. So here's an example of Foundry property test. Um, basically, you have what's called a setup function and then your test, right? And so the semantics here is you start from a blank state, you start from a, like a clean EVM state, and you execute the setup function, which maybe deploys some contracts, mints some balances to different users or something like that, and then you save off that state that you get after executing the setup function, and then you look at this function that has test add as owner, as the, uh, the name, and Foundry then looks at the parameter here, this uint 256x, and it's gonna pick a bunch of different random values to fill in for that parameter, um, again, and execute the whole entire test against that state that it got after executing the setup function, right? So somehow then you get a bunch of different runs of your test against that original setup state. So you kind of get a scenario you get to set up with the setup function, and then the test is run a bunch of different times with different param with the parameters filled in with different values, right? And I can't click on this link, but here's an example from uh, Alchemix, which is like a, a lending and borrowing platform on, on uh, Ethereum. And these get massive, and they also get really descriptive, right? Like this, this one I linked to here is like this big invariant description of, um, of their protocol, right? There's, there's a bunch of important invariants for the Alchemix protocol, and here they've described as a Foundry property test those invariants. So they can get really big, but Foundry is very fast, so you can run quite a few of these very quickly. Um, so this is kind of what the output of Foundry looks like. So you, you run forge tests like this, and the key here is, <clears throat> you see in the, the, first, the first test, we have like test withdraw with no parameters there. And you can see it did, it just says gas 19,418. So it just did one run of test withdrawal because there's no parameters. So there's nothing random for it to guess. But then where that lots of runs is pointing at, you see test add as owner, it ran it 256 times with a bunch of different values, right? And the, another key about Foundry is that it's really fast, right? Like here on the bottom is 40 milliseconds. It ran tons and tons of tests within 40 milliseconds. You might not think this is important because you're like, oh, testing, like you can run that pre-deployment, but actually Foundry has this option called Fork Mainnet, which lets you run your Foundry property tests against the current mainnet of the blockchain. And that's when it becomes important that it's fast because you can do, it's like poor man's, it's like poor man's monitoring at that point. So you can write down a bunch of property tests. <coughs> Sorry, I'm uh, nervous. <laughs> you can write down a bunch of property tests and run it against every new block that comes into the blockchain. And you know, you kind of get like a monitoring service out of this, but it's, it's kind of a lightweight monitoring service, if that makes sense. So anyway, super fast, lots of runs, important. So how do you go from there? How do you go from testing to verification? And that's what I'm gonna talk about now. So we have this tool called KVM. It's been available since 2017, but it's been really hard for people to use, and so people haven't been using it. Um, except for us, basically. We've been using it to do like some large-scale verifications of like multi-collateral DAI. The first deployment of multi-collateral DAI was fully verified using KVM uh, back in 2018, 2019. Um, <clears throat> but 
Yeah, so the, the KVM is an implementation of the Ethereum virtual machine in our tool called the K-Framework, which is this logical framework for modeling programming languages in. And from that, we can derive like basically a verification tool that can do verification, but it's really hard to use. And so we made this uh, tool that integrates it directly with Foundry. So you kind of just latch KVM onto an existing Foundry property test with no other setup, and maybe it works. Maybe it's able to pass those property tests through KVM and you are suddenly going from having you know unit test to property test like this level of assurance to oh I actually did full formal verification right so maybe it works so it's a free way to try to oh, something with the video it's a free way to try to increase your quality assurance basically um, but this is an expert tool right because once once the tool takes a misstep or it's not able to actually discharge a verification condition you're going to get some output that looks like this in the in the black here, you know. And I've kind of formatted a bit it a bit on the bottom, but you know, I wouldn't expect a normal Solidity developer to know what to do with this output here, right? So you either have to learn K, have to learn KVM, or you have to call up someone who's an expert. So that's why I say it's an expert tool. But anyway, you 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 work on your property test a bit. We have this property WMOL strictly increasing, so that's a um, you know WMOL is like the WAD rate rad. Uh, multiplication operation which um, does the which you know does fixed width integer multiplication which is actually really important that is correct because if you have rounding errors here those can compound and cause serious security issues right um, but anyway you do you know first you do this KVM foundry compile which you give it the output directory of your your foundry property test that's all you have to supply gives you a bunch of output and then at the bottom it says rope file Test foundry out compile kcfgs.json server. It says that at the bottom. Okay, you're ready to go. This is like a fixed amount of time it takes, a few minutes for it to run this, this command, right? And then you say, you know, KVM foundry prove, and then you give it the output directory, and then dash dash test, and then contract name dot function name. So you see that function name is the same as the, the foundry property test name from, the, from above. So first what you would do is you would just run foundry on it. You just run forge test on this just to see if Forge test is passing because if you're not even passing Forge's property testing, like there's no point in trying to run the, the verification. This takes a variable amount of time, basically based on how complicated the expression is. But anyway, it gave me back this counterexample, and here at the bottom I have a link to the documentation for the various symbols that are showing up here on the screen. If you were to study those symbols and kind of become an expert in the tool, suddenly you know okay, what I need to do is supply a lemma to the tool that says this, right? So now you run KVM foundry prove, same command, but you add this dash dash lemma and give it a lemma, which is like a simplification on the state. Okay, now the simplification goes through and you get this output that I show here on the bottom. And what this output is saying is, it's giving you a counter example. It's saying, you know, I found a way that your foundry property test actually does not pass. And that counter example is saying that happens when zero is equal to a and b is less than or equal to zero and zero is less than or equal to b so that's saying zero is equal to a and b is equal to zero right so that's what that that bottom line is saying and so if we look at our test up here we say c is equal to w mol 2 of a and b if a and b are both zero then c is zero and then the assert true at the end doesn't work right so w mol is not strictly increasing right so we found a we found a bug in our property using this right so we have to change it. It's not strictly increasing, it's just increasing, right? So we have, in the first property test here, we have less than C. In the next one, we have less than or equal to C, right? So it's, you know, this, this property actually goes through. So you see the tool output here says sharp top, which is, which is our way, the way our tool just says, yeah, it was proven. So now you know for sure that WML2 has this property that it's always increasing uh, the amount. It's never decreasing, which is what you would expect from, from uh, a foundry property test, so or from this code, basically. Okay, so I'm coming to the end of my talk. Um, what can you do if you're interested in this? You can learn K. There's a K tutorial that you can take. Um, you can install KVM. There's some instructions on there. It should be uh, now. It should be an easier install. We have like this Nix-based installation method for doing it. But if you have problems, please join our Discord, which is the next step there, and let me know about the problems because I want to fix them. Um, you can follow our Twitter, 
And then we also are now starting a blog series about how we've been using Foundry in our various engagements. So for a lot of our clients, we've actually been recommending to them that they start their own Foundry property test suites because it increases their level of assurance you know, from unit tests to property tests. And then maybe if this tool works, they also get verification out of it without having to you know, consult an expert. But like I said, it's an expert tool. And so if you, you know, if you don't know what's going wrong, you have to consult an expert at that point anyway. Um, and this is the first blog in that blog post series that we're doing. We're gonna be releasing a, a handful more over the coming months, so. Um, and then also we have a couple of DevCon talks, which um, I would recommend you watch or you know, watch the recordings or something like that. Um, one is by Raul Shafrinek, who's one of our auditors, and that's on October 11th, which I think is tomorrow at 3 p.m. in the Flowers Room. And he's gonna be talking about tackling rounding errors with precision analysis, and you know, maybe that sounds like Greek to you, but precision analysis is this practice of going through your arithmetic libraries and finding, you know, okay, this function rounds down, this function has these error bounds, this function rounds up. If you just go through each of your functions and write down those properties of each of these functions, somehow it becomes easier to show that the rest of your code is correct, basically. Um, and we actually, like, there's been several totally catastrophic, like devastating bugs we've found in clients' codes just doing this precision analysis thing. So it's a very formulaic thing you can do yourself in order to increase your own uh, software quality assurance. And actually, this example here, this WML increasing, this is a precision analysis property right here. Um, and then the other talk is by Ricard Hjort, which is another one of our auditors, on October 12th, the next day, and this is formal methods for the working DeFi dev. And I watched a practice run of this talk and it's really good. I think it gives you a lot of concrete steps you can take to increase your own quality assurance without um, having to you know, get a PhD. You know, it's a bunch of concrete steps you can take yourself. So um, anyway, thank you. And any questions? Sorry, I'm nervous.